Let's open tonight's service with hymn number 20 from your spiral, Gospel Hymns Hymnal, number 20, I'm saved by sovereign's grace. And let's all stand together. <clears throat> Before the world was made, God chose to save me by His grace and blessed me in His covenant head with every blessing of His grace. In Christ my surety was found, a ransom for God's chosen one. Deliverance was then proclaimed, and God's great work of grace begun. In the due time my Savior came to do His holy Father's will. A body was prepared for Him, that he might righteousness fulfill. When Christ had righteousness brought in, he took my awful load of sin, dying for me upon the tree. My Savior put away my sin. Though I was born a child of wrath, depraved and helpless, dead in sin, and though I chose the rebel's path, despising God and loving sin, my Savior's love could not be quenched, he sought and found me by His grace. Awakened by His Spirit's call, I'm saved, I'm saved by sovereign grace. Amazing, free, and sovereign grace, in love Christ Jesus took my place. Chosen, redeemed, and called by grace, to Christ alone I give all praise. My only hope, my only plea, is that Christ lived and died for me. In Him alone I am complete, to Christ alone. I pray shall be. Please be seated. There's a line in that hymn we just sang in the second stanza that says, Dying for me upon the tree, my Savior put away my sin. We're going to be looking at the images of the cross tonight in scriptures illustrated by the tree. But uh, before we do that, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> we'll begin reading in verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they say, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, 
Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and the wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These things are, true, are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Let's pray together. Our merciful and glorious Heavenly Father, we pray that you would once again, this hour, direct our hearts and our minds to that war that was fought at Calvary's cross and the battle that was won and uh, the glory that thy dear son has earned for himself and for thee in his conquering death and sin, Satan and hell. And Lord, that you would comfort the hearts of your saints as we find our hope and our rest in your accomplished redemption. Lord, we, we pray for the situation in the world today. We know, Lord, that the heart of the King, as is the heart of all men, are in thy hand, and that you direct it whithersoever you will. We know, Lord, that you are working all things together for good, for them that love you and those that are the called according to your purpose. We know that you reign sovereign over the armies of heaven and all the inhabitants of the earth and that no man can stay thy will, thy hand. And Lord, we, we ask for your mercy. We ask for your direction and for the comfort of your peace. And we pray that you would direct the governing authorities in a way that would bring uh, peace and and uh, life to this world. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Number 239 in your hardback hymnal. 239. Let's stand together again. <clears throat> Ask 
him to receive me, will he say me nay? Not till earth and not till heaven pass away. Finding, following, keeping, struggling, is he sure to bless? Saints, apostles, prophets, martyrs, answer yes. Please be seated. I was just thinking about this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you'd like to turn with me there in your Bible, this is not the message for tonight, but I think it'd be a word of encouragement to us in light of our current circumstances in the world. The Lord said there would be wars and rumors of wars, and there has been all throughout the history of mankind until that final war that we just read about in Revelation 19, when the Lord himself comes and brings an end to all things. But here he tells us in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, I exhort you therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Now, Daniel chapter 4 says that the Lord has put over the nations the basest of men. We ought not to be surprised when we see the character of national leaders. They are men that God has chosen, and he of his own testimony said that they are the basest of men. But we're still to pray for them, and to, we're to respect their authority. And so for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. But this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. The Lord remind us to pray for our governing authorities and know that they are puppets in our God's hands, but he has, he has given us the, the privilege and the responsibility of, of praying for them and um, that we might live quiet and peaceable lives in this world. <clears throat> Let's open our Bibles to Judges chapter 6. <clears throat> Judges chapter 6, and we'll be at verse 11. And I've titled this message, The Tree. The Tree. The Tree is mentioned time and time again in the scriptures, but we're going to try to limit our, our comments tonight to the oak tree, which is also mentioned many times in God's Word. As we know, <clears throat> in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Um, the Lord has given us types and pictures and shadows, all pointing to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished there at Mount Calvary in saving his people and putting away our sins. And so everything before the cross points to Christ hanging on Calvary's tree. Everything since the cross points us back to Christ. The cross is the reason for everything, everything. <clears throat> so as we read God's word, we're looking for Christ and him crucified. <laughs> uh, certainly he is the subject of this book. And uh, he's the author of it and he's the subject of it. And uh, to find him, to know him, and to rejoice in him is life eternal. <clears throat> Judges chapter 6, look with me at verse 11, if you will. And there came an angel of the Lord. Scripture's clear that this angel of the Lord is none other than the Lord himself. Look, at, look down at verse 16. And the Lord said unto him, <laughs> this is that angel speaking. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in the form of an angel sent from heaven to reveal Christ and him crucified. So there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak 
He sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertaineth to Joash, the Abizarite, and his son Gideon, threshing wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Now we saw Sunday that this, these Midianites is a picture of our sin. And, uh, and our, our flesh and Satan and this world and all the things that would take us away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, here we have Gideon, whose name translated means hewer. So Gideon by profession would cut down trees and hew those logs into uh, beams and boards that could be used uh, for construction or as we're going to see in this verse for a cross. Uh, the Lord is calling out Gideon, who's threshing wheat. We know what that's a picture of. The threshing of wheat is a picture of God winnowing the chaff from the wheat, dividing those that he has called, those that he has saved from the reprobate. And, uh, and the chaff is, so there's what, Gideon, this hewer, this, uh, this hewer of logs is, is hiding out from the Midianites behind a wine press. We know what that's a picture of. The scripture makes it clear the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he, was, he was pressed out all by himself in the wine press. There's a picture of the wrath of God um, coming down on the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And as the the wine from the, the grapes flowed from the wine press as those, as those grapes were being pressed. So the Lord Jesus Christ's blood flowed freely from his body as a covering for the sins of his people. So that's what all of this is to point to. This isn't just telling us about some man that's winnowing wheat. And this is, this is all the gospel, isn't it? This, is, this all points us to Christ. <clears throat> So here we have the Lord calling a hewer to hew, if you will, a log into a tree or into a beam that will be used as a cross and that will be the, the, the standard by which the Lord winnows his wheat and gathers his wheat and puts it into the barn and <laughs> takes his people home to glory. And through the means of which the blood of his, of his sacrifice is being, is being stamped out in the, in the wine press of God's wrath. The tree, as I mentioned, is often referred to in the scriptures. We have the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was in the garden that the Lord commanded our father Adam not to eat of, and he ate of it. And um, it's a picture of the law. And men are still putting their hand to the law. <laughs> Adam thought, well, I can, I can, you know, I can eat of that tree. I can, this is the knowledge of good and evil is the law. And, um, and so he, uh, and, and, and it was the only thing that, what is, the, what is the standard of the law? Thou shalt not. Was not the knowledge of the tree of good and evil the one thing that God said thou shalt not eat of? And so men are still trying to, to reach to godness, <laughs> reach the way to heaven through the keeping of the law. Uh, that's what all men do by nature. Apart from the revelation of Christ and the grace of God, all men by nature will try to earn favor with God by their lives. Uh, I, was, I was talking to a dear sister today. She's probably watching now. She lives in another city. And uh, she, said, she said, you know, she said, before the Lord saved me, before he called me, if, if you would asked me, you know, aren't you, are you, are you saved? She would have said, she said, uh, uh, she said, yeah, I'm not doing anything wrong. <laughs> I'm not doing anything wrong. You know, I'm a, surely, you know, my life is a reflection of a, of a, of a Christian. And, uh, 
and we both agreed on the phone as we were talking today that she had done enough wrong when she was sitting wherever you're sitting right now in church to send her to hell. I'm doing enough wrong right now in what I'm doing, standing up here trying to preach the gospel to send me to hell. This idea that well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I can, you know, I can stand before a holy God. No, you can't. But men still think that way, don't they? They still think that way. They still think that they're going to be saved by the law. They put their hand to the knowledge, to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then we have the tree of life in the garden, which they were um, allowed to eat from until after the fall. They were allowed to eat of that. That tree of life is, is Christ. He's seen back in the book of Revelation. Uh, bringing forth his fruit and his leaves being for the healing of the nations. And, and uh, once, once man had fallen and you and I fell in our father, Adam, and Adam all have died, uh, we could not partake of the tree of life until, until God did a work of grace in our hearts and killed us. Adam physically had to die, <laughs> and so do you and I. But we die spiritually when, uh, when the Lord makes us to be sinners, don't we? And we realize that, that everything about us is death. Uh, so this tree is uh, <clears throat> this tree of life that we see in the garden is the tree that we're talking about. It had to become the tree of death. <laughs> uh, the Lord Jesus Christ had to bear in his body the sins of all of his people, all their sins of every generation. And he had to hang on this, this tree that was hewed out by, by uh, Gideon. And the uh, tree of life had to become the tree of death before we could have life. And that's exactly what all these trees uh, point to. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us. Hath, past tense. Christ Jesus the Lord hath redeemed us. What is the redemption? A redemption is a purchase. What did he, what, what, what was the price that God demanded for the purchase of our souls? Not, not silver and gold. <laughs> no, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who was pressed out in the wine press of God's wrath on Calvary's cross. And God took that, that, that blood and put it on the mercy seat. And God said, here, I'll meet with you. Right here, I'll meet with you. So Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us. We've been bought with a price, the price of the precious blood of Christ, being made a curse for us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For as it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. So this oak tree that the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting under is a, is a symbol of the cross. It, it's repeated over and get, over again in the scriptures. Every time this tree is brought up, it points us to the cross of Christ. And, uh, and so... Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. And John the Baptist, when he was preaching, said, the axe has been laid to the root of the tree. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that tree had to, be, had to be chopped down. But the life of the tree is in the root. <laughs> and the Gentiles are the, are the wild olive tree that was grafted into this, to this root that continues to live. Peter, when he stood before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 5, you remember they said to him, uh, they, they'd already arrested him and put him in prison, and the Lord came and brought him out of prison. <laughs> and the gates were still shut, the guards were still in place, the Sanhedrin sent for him, and the guards came back and said, he's not there, we don't, we don't know what happened to him. We arrested him, we put him in prison, the, the guards have been up all night, no one came, but they're not there. And then someone else came and said, they're in the synagogue preaching. <laughs> 
So they sent the police to get them. This time they arrested them quietly in fear of the crowds and they, and they brought them back before the Sanhedrin and they said, did we not tell you not to preach this doctrine for you filled the whole city of Jerusalem with this, with this doctrine? And that's when Peter said, you decide for yourself what, what's right or wrong. As for us, we must obey God. We've got to do what God's called us to do. And then he preaches the gospel to them. And he says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus from the dead, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. <laughs> so there's the tree. The very first time Peter preaches to this Sanhedrin, he said, you slew him and you hanged him on a tree. In Acts chapter 13, when Paul goes to Antioch of Pisidia, he goes into the synagogue and he preaches uh, to the Jews there. And he says, uh, and when they had fulfilled, he's speaking of those Jews in Jerusalem. He said, and when they had fulfilled all that had been written of them. <laughs> See, when they took their wicked hands and crucified the son of God on Calvary's tree, they were, they were fulfilling all that God had ordained for them. And so they were fully responsible for having put the son of God to death, but they were fulfilling the ordained purpose of God to send his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And so Peter says to this group in Acts 13 and verse 29, it says, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sepulcher. So the, the cross is referred to as a tree. And here we have the Lord Jesus Christ in, John, in, in Judges chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at the life of Gideon for the next couple of weeks. And uh, what a glorious picture. This picture just keeps repeating itself over and over again in different ways. But it's the same story. And, 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 and so we have the Lord Jesus Christ as the angel of the Lord sitting under an oak tree, revealing himself and calling to himself a hewer who's threshing wheat and, and he's hiding out behind the wine press. <laughs> now that's where you and I need to hide. We need to hide behind the wine press, don't we? Where God has pressed out the wrath and judgment of, of God and the wine press of his wrath. And where the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we do, it'll be because we've, we've looked to him on that tree. Everything points us back to Christ and to him crucified. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 35. The first time that an oak tree is mentioned in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 35. Um, Jacob has now left Laban's. He has escaped in God's providence, uh, his brother Esau's wrath. He has wrestled with the angel of the Lord at the river Jabbok, and the Lord has left him a limp to remind him of the weakness of his flesh. And, uh, and now Jacob has his whole family together, all of his children, his wives, his cattle. And guess where he's going to go? Back to Bethel. Bethel is where the Lord revealed himself when Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau. And uh, remember, that's where Jacob made for himself a pillow with a stone out of a stone. And, and uh, the Lord showed him a ladder going up into heaven and the angel of the Lord ascending and descending upon that ladder. And so, and, and he called it Bethel, the house of God. <laughs> God is, and now Jacob is going back to Bethel with his whole family. But before he gets to Bethel, something has to be done. And here it is in Genesis chapter 35 and God, verse one, and God said unto Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make thee an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau, thy brother. 
Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. There's repentance. <laughs> repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your idols. Put them away from you. And uh, look to Christ and the robe of his righteousness for all of your acceptance before God. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all the earrings which were in their ears. You see what this, uh, the strange gods in their hands, that's, that's works, isn't it? That your hand is a picture of your work and, and they're putting away any hope of salvation in being able to accomplish it by the works of their hands, by their own works, their own righteousness. And the earrings, well, you wouldn't know what that's a picture of. <laughs> the hearing ears of the Lord and uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. But by nature, men listen to so many different voices. And so the Lord says, give me the works of your hands. Give me the things that you've been listening to. And I'm going to do something with them. Which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was at Shechem. Now the word Shechem means back or shoulder. <laughs> it's the... It's the, it's the, it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross who bore on his back, if you will, we bear on our back, nothing but a dead corpse. That's what Paul said. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death that's strapped to my back. That's all I've got to carry around is a dead corpse. But the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was suspended between heaven and earth, bore on his shoulders at Shechem on his back. All the works of their, of his people and all the error of their hearing. And he buried them under the oak tree at Shechem. <laughs> That's where our sins are, brethren. They're buried in the depths of the sea. They've been separated from us as far as the east is from the west. And God remembers them no more. This is the first mention of an oak in the Bible. It's the place where our sins have been put away under the oak, <laughs> never to be found again. What a comfort, what a hope. <clears throat> and then the second time an oak is mentioned, it's not, the oak tree's not mentioned, but maybe a dozen times in the Bible, but two of them are right here back to back. So now he buries all these idols and all these earrings under the oak tree at Shechem, where Christ bore our sins and put them away. And then he takes his family down to Bethel. And when he gets to Bethel, Deborah, it's not the same Deborah that we just studied in the book of Judges. This is uh, Rebecca's, uh, you remember in Genesis chapter 24, when Abraham sent his servant to Laban's to get a wife for Isaac. And Rebecca said, I will go. And the next verse says, and Rebecca and her handmaid, which was Deborah, left. So Deborah has been at Rebecca's side from the, from the very time she left home. And now Deborah dies. Look at verse, look at verse eight. But Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. And the name of it was called Alon. Bachuth, the oak of weeping. It was not the, the work that the Lord Jesus Christ did and the, the sacrifice that he made of himself bring weeping? Sure it does. Our weeping will be turned to joy. <laughs> but there was weeping in heaven when the Lord Jesus laid down his life 
The angels in heaven were prepared with swords drawn to come and destroy the whole world to deliver their Lord. But they weren't allowed to. And there was weeping in heaven. There was weeping among his father. When the Lord cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Was there not, was there not sorrow in the heart of his father? Was there not weeping among the disciples and among his mother? And is there not weeping with us? Our weeping, like I said, has turned to joy. But blessed, the Bible says, are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. There's no comfort until there's mourning. There has to be a, a sorrow and a brokenness and a revelation of our sinfulness before God. And what that sin has done to our Savior on Calvary's cross before we can before we can rejoice. Turn with me to the last book of the Bible, Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. Look with me at verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. Now here's God's promise. I'm going to pour out upon my people, the house of Israel and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is the church, a spirit. And that spirit is going to be a spirit of grace and it's going to be a spirit of supplication. And as a result of that, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitter for his firstborn. <laughs> That's the spirit of repentance. That's the spirit of grace that the Lord gives to his people. When he brings to your heart the realization of what you are. Lord, I, I've got nothing but sin and it was my sin that put Christ on Calvary's cross. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rebun in the city of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, and the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. This mourning is a, is a, is a work of grace in each individual person's heart. We, we're not looking for a, a, you know, some sort of a mass mourning. We're not looking for, you know, we, we're each man, each woman, every child has to deal with God one-on-one. -on -one. And when he pours out that spirit, verse 13, the family of the house of Levi apart and the house of, and their wives apart and the family of Shimei apart and their wives apart and all the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. Look at verse 13, chapter 13, verse one. And in that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. <laughs> you see, there's the morning turned to joy, but there has to be a morning. Deborah was buried under, under a great oak in Bethel, in the house of God, which is where we are. And that oak was called the oak of mourning, weeping, weeping. Whenever Christ is preached, there is some weeping. There is some sorrow. The spirit of grace is poured out on Jerusalem. There is a sense of, Lord, this is, this is all on me. <laughs> and he says, no, nah, I put it all on me. <laughs> and there, there's reason now for rejoicing. The third time that Oak is mentioned, it is the name of, of the valley, and we'll just, you know the story. It is the name of the valley where David slew Goliath. The name of that valley was the Valley of Oak. And you know what that's a picture of. David as our representative head stood as our substitute against Satan, against sin, against hell and against the grave. And he got the victory for all by himself. 
for all of Israel. All of Israel enjoyed the benefits of what David did when he took Goliath's own sword. Now, you know what the sword is a picture of. It's a picture of the tongue. It's a picture of words, the sword of the spear, which is the word of God. And now what's the Lord doing? He's taking, by your words, you shall be condemned. And by your words, you shall be justified. And so the Lord's taking the very confession of the false gospel, the free will works gospel, and he's using it to cut the head off of the, off of the giant. And the Lord Jesus Christ gets the victory. Where did he get it? He got it in the Valley of Oak. He got it on that oak tree. You know, people speculate what kind of tree the cross is made of. I don't have any idea. But I know it was a tree and I suspect that it may have been an oak tree. Uh, <clears throat> but nevertheless, this is, this is where the oak is mentioned in scripture pointing us to that tree where the Lord Jesus Christ died. That, that story of David and Goliath is a picture of substitution and satisfaction. <laughs> uh, the Lord Jesus as our substitute satisfied everything that was necessary for the salvation of Israel when he slew the giant by himself in the Valley of Oak. The angel of the Lord Judges chapter 6, verse 11, is sitting under an oak. He's calling out a hewer who's threshing wheat behind a wine press. And he's giving us another picture, another picture of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The next time an oak is mentioned in the Bible is when Absalom stands up in rebellion against his father. Now, We've looked at Absalom before, been some time, but Absalom's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what the Bible says about Absalom. It says that all Israel praised him for his beauty. That's what the Bible says about Absalom. All Israel praised him for his beauty, for from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head, there was not a blemish. That's, that's that. And Absalom, what brought Absalom on the scene? You remember when uh, Amnon took advantage of Tamar and Tamar was Absalom's sister. And the Bible refers to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Song of Solomon as the sister of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and Absalom in defending the honor of his sister kills um, Amnon for having taken advantage of his sister. Is that not what our Lord has done? For in contrast to him, from the sole of our feet to the crown of our head is nothing but putrefying sores and wounds. But all Israel praises him for his beauty, <laughs> for not a blemish is to be found on him. He's the, he's the lamb of God that is without spot and without blemish. And he went to that tree on Calvary's hill and he laid down his life. Absalom name, Abba, uh, father, Salom, peace. <laughs> you want my father's peace? <laughs> You're gonna have it through this story. What is the story? Well, when the Lord Jesus Christ is spoken of in, in uh, Song of Solomon chapter 5, the scripture says that his hair was his glory and it was black like a raven. And then when we read of the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation, we see his hair white <laughs> demonstrating his wisdom, but it's also his glory. And the Bible speaks of the hair being the glory of the woman. And, uh, and it speaks of baldness as being shameful in the Bible. And so this picture of the hair is a picture of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what happened to Absalom? What happened to him? He got his hair 
hung up in an oak while he was fleeing from, from David's men. And, uh, and he was hanging there in that tree by his hair in the bough of an oak tree. By the glory, the Lord Jesus Christ was hanging on a tree by his glory. And, and, and Joab saw him and, say, and thrust him through with three darts, the scripture says. Thrust him through his heart with three darts. I think you see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all participants in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. That covenant of grace that goes down, that goes back before the foundation of the world was an agreement between God the Father who would choose a people and God the Son who would redeem a people and God the Holy Spirit that would, that would empower the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah and then, and then give the knowledge of the gospel to his people. Those are, they all three participated in the death of Christ. And then the scripture says in the same verse, after Joab put three darts through his heart, he said, then 10 of his men came and slew him. <laughs> you know what the number 10 is a picture of? It's the law. It was the law of God that slew the Lord Jesus Christ. When God's law saw your sin and my sin on Christ, on his shoulders, on Shechem, he had buried them in his body on that tree. It was the law that slew him. After God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all were in agreement that this sacrifice must be made. The law came along and slew him. And if the law found sin on the Lord Jesus Christ and had no choice but to slay the Son of God, what do you think the law is going to do to you and me if it finds sin on us? And like I said earlier, there's enough sin in what we're doing right now for the law to judge us guilty and condemn us to hell. This is why the angel of the Lord is sitting under an oak tree. This is, this is what this... This is what this tree is all about. Now, the cross, this oak tree, has been an object of idolatry. We see that in religion. That's why as believers, we don't put necklaces on with crosses on them we don't put crosses on our churches we don't we don't do that why you remember when the fiery serpents came into the camp of the israelites in the wilderness and the lord told moses you fashion a, a, a serpent out of brass and put it on a pole and if any man look he shall live <laughs> uh or when he looks he shall live and um you know, they kept that brass serpent for 700 more years. 700 years from the time of Moses to the time of Hezekiah in the 7th century BC. And Hezekiah was a good king and he, and he took that thing. And the Bible tells us uh, what he called it. I forgot the name of it, it's a big old, some big old long name, but the interpretation is a piece of brass. That's what he called it, a piece of brass. And he broke it up and destroyed it with all the other idols uh, that the children of Israel were worshiping. That's all, the, that's all the cross is, the physical cross. We don't put up physical cross. Why? Because that's just a piece of wood or a piece of plaster, or a piece of metal, whatever. That's all it is. No, it's the one who laid down his life upon that cross that accomplished the work of redemption for his people that were worshiping. And we don't fashion something in, that our eyes can look upon. We've got to have the eyes of faith to look upon Christ. Men love having, they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh and they that are of the spirit, the things of the spirit. We can only see the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on Calvary's cross through the eyes of faith. And we don't fashion something that we can look at with our physical eyes and try to get some comfort from that. 
It's nothing more than a piece of brass. Men have been doing it. Men have been doing it for centuries. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 16. Let me show you something here. Ezekiel chapter 16. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 6, I'm sorry. Ezekiel chapter 6 at verse 13. When the Lord reveals himself in verse 13, it says, Then shall you know that I am the Lord. When their slain men shall be among their idols, round about their altars, upon every high hill, and in all the tops of the mountains, and under every green tree, and under every thick oak, the place where they did offer sweet savor to all their idols. How many men are going are gonna to meet the wrath and judgment of God because they made their sweet, savory sacrifices to God under the idol of a cross. A thick cross. A thick oak. You know what that means? That means that they won't, they won't, they won't give it up. They won't give it up. That's a strong oak tree. It's a thick oak tree. And yet, men that are addicted to it will not, will not turn from it. To turn from, they will not turn from their idols to worship and serve the living and true God. Unless God does a work of grace in their heart. And when he does, oh, they turn happily. <laughs> happily. They're made, they're made willing. In 1 Chronicles chapter 10, Saul and his sons are an example of that. You remember Saul was injured by, in, a, in a battle with the Philistines. He had a mortal injury and, he, and one of his servants came along and he tried to get his servant to kill him. And the servant refused to lay his hand to the king. And so Saul fell on his sword and his sons fell on their swords with him. And the Philistines found their bodies and they disgraced their bodies and they decapitated them and put their heads in the temple of Dagon. And then the men of Jabesh, the men of Jabesh translated means dry place, came and got the remains and buried their bones under an oak tree at the dry place, Jebish. What is Saul a picture of? The Israelite who's not of Israel. The tares among the wheat. Disgraced. And yet they're finally buried. How many men? I mean, we you go to the, you've been to the, you've been to some of these places, cathedrals around the world where they where they bury their heroes in the very under the very floor, under the pulpit, or they got the the, the the things all around, you know, what buried their bones in a dry place where there was no water and no life. What a glorious picture of our Lord who reveals himself as an angel sitting under an oak tree, calling out a hewer of wood to fashion for himself a pole upon which he will die and press out the wine press of God's wrath and winnow his wheat. It's what all of scripture is about. It's what all of our life is about. <laughs> Christ and him crucified. Our heavenly father, we pray that you bless your word and cause us to rejoice in Christ Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. 232. Let's stand together. 232.
Christ, our Redeemer, died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Chiefest of sinners, Jesus will save all he has promised that he will do. Wash in the fountain opened for sin, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Judgment is coming, all will be there, each one receiving justly his due. Hide in the saving, sin-cleansing blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Oh, great compassion, oh, boundless love, oh, loving kindness, faithful and true. Find peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when blood when I see the blood